My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained, paranormal, and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. Beauty pageants have traditionally been contests that focus on ranking people by their physical attributes. In current times, pageants have evolved to include inner beauty, talent, and intelligence, but the reason that people enter these contests haven't really changed. Some enter to build confidence, while some use it as a way to meet new people. More often, winning pageants gives the contestants opportunities in the worlds of modeling and entertainment. And then there's all the cash prizes and possible scholarships that one can win. This makes entering pageants enticing to many. But most may not realize that there's a dark side behind these contests. For some, beauty pageants can trigger eating disorders, lower self-esteem, and cause depression. But for others, being center stage gets them noticed in ways that no one would ever want. Welcome to Episode 106, Beauty Queen Murders. Tara Fair's life did not start out very well. Tara was born on January 10, 1996 in Baghdad, Iraq. Her parents converted to Islam when she was six years old, and a year later, her country was in turmoil. This is when the United States invaded Iraq, saying their intent was to disarm Iraq of weapons of mass destruction, end Saddam Hussein's support for terrorism, and free the Iraqi people. This resulted in their society being fractured into different sects, and some of these carried what was considered to be more extremist beliefs. When Tara turned 16, her father decided to marry her off to a much older man. Concerning this time in her life, Tara once said, and I quote, Before I got married, I was going to school and taking my final exams. I heard my father telling my mother, Pray to God that your daughter will not pass the 11th grade. I want her to stay home so she can get married. This was the beginning of her personal hell. Tara's husband would regularly physically abuse her. After seeing the cuts and bruises on Tara's face and body, her parents decided to remove her from her husband's home. They were terrified what this man could do to her and her baby. Because at this point, Tara was now pregnant. After Tara's son Amir was born, her now ex-husband showed up at her parents' home with a group of men. Her ex had connections with many powerful local tribal members, and these armed men ordered Tara and her family to hand over her son. Terrified, they did what they were told to do. Tara would never see her son again. She would later publicly say that, and I quote, They took my son away from me when I was a kid and couldn't do anything about it especially against armed people teaming up with my ex. Now without her child, Tara tried to move on with her life. As part of this, she started to compete in the local beauty pageant circuit and did very well. At the age of 18, Tara won the title of Miss Baghdad, and at 19, she was the runner-up in the Miss Iraq contest. This is when her ex-husband came out of the woodwork again. He got their wedding photos published as a way to try to control her, but it didn't work. Tara's fame started to grow, and as part of that, she started using Instagram in 2016. She built a large following and posted pictures and videos of her in her everyday life. She then started using her platform as a way to speak out against forced marriage, spousal abuse, and her country's expectation that women are subservient to men. She would regularly speak out about how she thought women like her are not even being treated as human beings. As Tara's fame grew, she started to present herself how she chose to and not how the people in her community wanted her to. She started wearing jeans and close-fitting clothing. She wore makeup and experimented with different hairstyles and colors. She got tattoos and she started traveling where she wanted and how she wanted. This was considered to be very unusual for this time, and even though she was getting praise from her fans, she also started to receive threats. But this didn't stop Tara. As her followers continued to increase, Tara continued to post about her living a life that may seem normal to us, but was very different to those around her. 
She started working as a model for various cosmetic and clothing companies, and Tara started to dream that maybe, someday, she could start her own cosmetic and clothing brands. But Tara's fans did not know the real Tara. They only knew the image she projected. Some saw her as brave and as an outspoken young woman, and others saw her as a symbol of rebelling against tradition. What they didn't know is that she had a fear of being alone, a fear of the dark, and that due to her growing fame, she had a hard time trusting people. Yet at the same time, Tara would ignore the threats she received. She would tell her loved ones that she didn't have any enemies since she didn't hurt anyone. But Tara was wrong. At the time of Tara's death, she had built up an Instagram following of about 2.7 million people and was considered to be one of Iraq's biggest internet stars. Her fearless posts had angered the traditionalists in her country, though. On the evening of September 26, 2018, she phoned two of her friends. She was happy to tell them that she had just finished her latest advertising job and was looking forward to leaving the next day to have a holiday in Malaysia. The following day, as she was driving in an upscale Baghdad neighborhood, gunmen on motorcycles opened fire and she was shot several times. Tara passed away soon afterwards, but she wasn't the only high-profile female killed during this time, and other bloggers and influencers in Baghdad went into hiding, terrified that they could be next. The public reaction to Tara's murder was swift. Many Iraqis mourned her loss, while others still condemned her. In fact, a governmental official publicly said that Tara brought on the violence onto herself. The motives behind her killing are still unclear, but there are several theories. The most prominent one was that Tara infuriated the Iraqi conservatives who considered her online behavior unacceptable and provocative. It was her murder that brought to light a trend of violence against successful and outspoken Iraqi women at the time. Two days before, a female human rights activist was killed, and a month earlier, a female plastic surgeon who organized national medical programs for women was also murdered. A week later, a female beauty expert was found dead in her home, and other well-known Iraqi women started getting threats that they were next. In the aftermath of Tara's death, the Prime Minister called for an immediate investigation. Within two days, police had arrested a suspect, but for some reason, the investigation was not concluded. Why? Well, it kind of boils down to a corrupt judicial system. It is currently believed that Tara was murdered by local extremists, and even though the government claimed that the murderers will be brought to justice, most believe that this is unlikely to ever happen. Now, for our next tale, it has something in common with our last. It's still unsolved. Jill Ann Weatherwax was born on October 26, 1970, in the United States to her father Jim and her mother Joan, who was a former bathing suit model. According to her father, Jill started showing her musical talent by the age of two. At the age of 10, Jill saw an ad in a local newspaper for a modeling and dance school, and she begged to go. She started taking classes on modeling, tap, and ballet dancing, and this soon gave her the confidence to try out for cheerleading in the ninth grade. She soon started dating one of the football players in her school, and by her senior year, she started to enter as many local beauty pageants as she could. She won most of them. Now, those who are close to Jill say that she didn't speak about going to Hollywood until she met a man named Stephen McGuire at a fashion show in Chicago. Jill's mother, Joan, would later admit that she didn't ask any questions. She and her husband, Jim, were only told his name and that he offered to give Jill a one-way ticket to Hollywood and he would introduce her around. They didn't really think about this at all other than to tell Jill that she could go as long as Stephen would buy her a return ticket just in case. Without any plan other than somehow become famous, Jill left for Hollywood to chase her dream. After going to Hollywood, Jill did not have a stable place to live. After walking into a talent agency named New Faces, the owner suggested that she enroll in acting classes and get some headshots done. But the owner soon noticed that she did not do that and believed she would be discovered somehow. This is when the New Faces owner reached out to Joe DiCarlo, who managed singer and actress Cher at the time. The agent said Jill was new in town and she had no place to stay. After being told she looks like actress Kim Basinger, Joe told the agent that, well, she can stay until she found some traction. 
Jill would stay at Joe's Beverly Hills penthouse for the next six months. And during this time, Jill's behavior made Joe very frustrated. He would later say that she'd spent her time sitting around in his home and writing song lyrics. She did not work on her career at all. Joe then decided to have a one-way conversation with Jill. He said he would not send her to people saying that she wanted to be a singer when, in his opinion, she wasn't that good. He then told her that she was to find another place to stay, and this is when Jill met Ciro Orsini. Jill and Ciro could not be more different. She was now a 19-year-old beauty queen, and he was a middle-aged man who came from London determined to make a name for himself. He dreamed of being the next big restaurateur after he opened a string of clubs and restaurants in Europe, which were called Ciro's Pizza Pomardero. He opened his first American restaurant on Beverly Boulevard, but he wasn't able to get the same type of clientele into that restaurant like he did his European ones. In fact, his flagship restaurant in London, England, was frequented by Princess Diana, Princess of Wales. But in his Beverly Boulevard restaurant, he attracted those on the fringes of fame and wannabe moguls. It was these people that became his close friends. But that is not what Jill saw when she met Ciro. After asking her out, Ciro took her to his restaurant. It was here that he started to hold court, and Jill was dazzled by him spending large amounts of cash and when he started to name drop. Very soon after they met, Ciro moved Jill into his two-bedroom bachelor pad just off Sunset Boulevard. To give you all an insight into her mindset at the time, Jill's mother would later say that when her daughter called her to tell her about her new relationship, she said, and I quote, I met the most fantastic man. He's Mr. Hollywood. This is when Jill started to live the life that she always dreamed about. Ciro lavished her with gifts, jewelry, and clothes. He then started to pay for her to have cosmetic surgery, and he allowed her to perform in his European and American clubs as much as she wanted. He started to introduce her to people like King Hussein of Jordan, Patrick Swayze, and heavyweight boxer Lennox Lewis. She further posed nude for one of Ciro's friends, who just happened to be a photographer for the men's magazine Penthouse. He would later go on to publish her photos in the men's magazine called Platinum and Club. But even though Jill was living the life she dreamed of, she was still missing one thing, a recording contract. Through her boyfriend, she had met some of the biggest names in the business, but she still could not become the famous singer that she dreamed of. Many speculate that this could be why when Ciro's Beverly Hills restaurant failed in 1991, he came up with a new plan. He decided to stage an elaborate pageant like no one in Hollywood seen before. He would have Jill compete in this pageant, and to no one's shock, Jill won the title of the contest, which was Miss Hollywood. Now, the ironic thing about this title was that the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce had discontinued their Miss Hollywood pageant many years before. That is why people raise questions about the contest's validity. Sarah would tell everybody who would ask that Jill won the contest fair and square, even though he was the one that provided the prize. So what was the prize? It was a recording contract with his newly formed music label. None of this mattered to Jill at all. Her dreams were now within her reach. After winning her new crown, Jill moved to Europe with Ciro, where she performed in his clubs in London, Paris, and Istanbul. She then recorded her first record under Ciro's label. It was called Shake Me Sexy, and it featured her nude on the cover. But this is not what it all seems. Those around her thought that maybe Jill was losing her way because she started to drink heavily and started picking up women. By early 1996, Ciro decided to send Jill home to her parents after she suffered what her friends would later describe as a nervous breakdown. They claimed that this was due to Jill discovering that she was pregnant. Ciro demanded that she have an abortion because the baby would destroy both of their career plans. When Jill got home, her parents convinced her to seek medical help for her alleged breakdown. She was soon diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was given medication to help deal with her severe mood swings. Soon afterwards, Ciro flew Jill back to London after the couple agreed to try to make things work. It was not meant to be. 
In the fall of 1996, Ciro bought Jill another plane ticket to take her back to Hollywood. Jill's friends would later say that the couple agreed that Jill would work on her career, and if she would straighten out, the two would be married. Ciro, on the other hand, would later say that he was planning to marry her without any conditions. He said at this point, he needed to be in the Middle East due to his rapidly expanding business, and Jill's career would only improve if she went back to Hollywood. When Jill landed in Hollywood, things were already arranged for her by Ciro. She was to share an apartment with one of Ciro's male friends, but that's not what she wanted, and she soon moved into a one-bedroom apartment in West Hollywood. The area she moved to was well known for its drugs and prostitution, and it was known not to be safe. She also got a job with the help of Ciro. She was hired to work in a club of one of Ciro's friends as an exotic dancer. Ciro would later say that he wanted her to work in a place that she could be watched over, and this would ensure that she would stay in the right path. Now, my dear listeners, I know that you're seeing all the red flags I'm seeing, but as you're likely guessing, things are about to get much worse. While living in West Hollywood, Jill made friends quickly with those in the area. This included drug users, dealers, and sex workers. Those around her at that time would tell her that she was susceptible to situations that weren't good for her and weren't safe, and they were correct. In the spring of 1997, Jill attempted to reconnect with her half-brother Scott, who was thrown out of the family home years before for doing drugs. She wanted to stay with him, but Scott, he was apprehensive. Why? Both he and his roommate Butch were ex-convicts who were still on the other side of the law. They were also both addicted to heroin. Scott decided that Jill could stay, but as soon as she moved in, Scott discovered that Butch and Jill started sleeping together. Scott moved out. Being around Butch and his addiction led Jill to get her own. She got addicted to meth, and this combined with her mental health condition was not good at all. She would be regularly seen walking down the local streets talking to herself and hallucinating. She would meet men in bars and start pitting them against each other for her affections. After the fighting would start, she would slip out of the establishment. Now this led to her being banned from several establishments. Meanwhile, Ciro was still sending her money and still claims that they were engaged at this time. This money Jill was happy to take since she lost her job as an exotic dancer. This was because she would report to work too high to dance, and if she was actually able to hit the stage, she would often walk off in the middle of a set to leave with men who promised her drugs. By fall of that same year, Jill became homeless. Butch kicked her out, and Scott refused to take her in. She started to couch surf and would stay with any man who would provide for her drug habit. By January of 1998, Cyril came back to Hollywood for business and to check up on Jill. He arranged for her to be brought to a restaurant on Sunset Boulevard, and he also invited a large group of friends to have dinner with them. Jill spent most of their time together asking for money, and by 10 p.m., she became disoriented even though no one saw her drinking or doing drugs for the entire night. Ciro asked his friend to take her back home, but since she didn't have a home, she was dropped off at the home of some fisherman that she knew. What Ciro didn't know was this would be the last time he would see Jill alive. On February 4th, 1998, Jill ran into her friend Mia in jail. Jill was arrested for public intoxication and Mia was arrested for domestic violence. Mia would later say that Jill told her that she was scared and that someone wanted to kill her, but she would not say who or why. After being released from jail, Jill mysteriously left town to go to Fresno, California on March 20th, 1998. Over the next five days, she interacted with the local sex workers, drug dealers, and the police. Those who saw her said her only possession was her small purse. She would laugh at one moment, but start crying the next. She would tell them that she was terrified of being alone, but not say what she was afraid of or why she came to town in the first place. No one reported seeing her actually participating in sex work, but what they did see was Jill lured three men into a room at a local hotel. Whatever deal they arranged did not come to fruition. Jill backed out and she called her mother. According to her mother, Jill sounded fine, but this proves that Jill actually was a good actress. 
Her body was found on March 24, 1988, stabbed and dumped in a dirt lot behind an animal shelter. After Jill's parents got this horrible news, they reached out to Ciro to let him know. Ciro came straight back to America, and he asked Jill's parents if they would let him stay in Jill's room since he believed that this is what she would want. Now, staying at Jill's parents' home was not the only thing that got the tongues wagging. At the funeral, Ciro was acting like he was at a movie star's meet and greet. He would tell anybody that would listen that Jill reached out to him from the spirit world, and she told him that her killers would soon be found. Well, he was wrong. Since Jill's death, Ciro has posted a $20,000 reward for information, consulted with psychics, and have bombarded police with multiple theories concerning Jill's death. But none of this helped, since Jill's case is considered to have gone cold. But there is one thing that this story tells us, is that Hollywood is not all glamour and riches. Our next story starts in a small town, and there's one thing that is consistent about these places. Everyone knows about each other. If you don't know a person personally, you likely know someone in their family or their friend group, or if not, you likely have heard of them. This is no different for the small town of Nixa in Missouri. Everyone from this town in the United States knew Jackie Johns in 1985. To this day, they will describe the 20-year-old former beauty queen as beautiful and charismatic. Everyone who came into the local cafe where she worked loved her and knew that she drove a distinctive black Camaro with the license plate of Jackie One. On June 18th of that year, a delivery driver saw Jackie's vehicle on the side of the road. It appeared abandoned, and since that was something Jackie would never do, the driver called Jackie's boss at the cafe. He told the boss what he just saw, and the man rushed out to where Jackie's car was found. When he arrived at the scene, the two men decided to move closer to the car. They noticed her car door was partially open, her purse was in the car along with some clothes, and the inside was splattered with what looked like blood. The men immediately called 911. When the police arrived, they were also extremely concerned for Jackie. When they searched Jackie's Camaro, they found the same things the two previous men did, but that's not all. Inside the car's trunk was a carjack. It was covered with human hair and blood. With this, the authorities immediately launched a massive search. The police were able to discover that the last time Jackie was seen was when she was leaving her evening shift the previous night. When the community heard about the search, how Jackie's car was found and what was found inside of it, they were shocked. After all, Jackie was so loved and so popular that it wasn't even a contest when she entered and won the title of Nixa's Sucker Days Festival. This certainly had to be some sort of prank. But it wasn't. Four days later, people who were fishing in a nearby lake saw a woman's body in the water and called the police. Jackie was found naked and covered in bruises. It was clear that she fought hard against her attacker, but stopped when she was struck multiple times with what was determined to be the carjack in the trunk of her car. There were also very clear signs that she was sexually assaulted. Using a receipt found in her car, authorities were able to determine that she stopped at a convenience store before her attack. It was confirmed by staff that she was there about 11 p.m., and using this information along with the state of her body when it was found, it was determined that she was killed soon after the stop at the store. Police started questioning the people in Jackie's life, from her boyfriend to the customers at the cafe. This is when authorities came to learn that Jackie may have had a stalker. Those interviewed spoke about a man who was known as the town character. He would leave Jackie gifts, but it was soon determined that he couldn't have done it. He was in jail at the time of Jackie's murder. But police didn't stop thinking that there was something to this, since Jackie's friends told them that in the days before her death, Jackie thought she was being watched. And then a tip came in. Someone reached out to the police to tell them that they saw Jackie's car at the convenience store, but they also noticed a very distinct vehicle there also. It was a blue and white 1960s Chevrolet. This was confirmed by another witness, and authorities knew exactly who in their small town owned that vehicle. It was a 28-year-old man named Gerald Carnahan. He was a regular at the cafe that Jackie worked at, and he came from a local wealthy family. 
Gerald was brought in for questioning, and he admitted that he knew Jackie from her workplace. She, in fact, had worked for him for a short time at his family's business, but it wasn't like they were friends. Gerald said on the night of the murder, he was having dinner with his stepdaughter, and they returned home at 10.45 p.m. Well, this didn't make much sense. Why did two witnesses confirm that Gerald's car was outside the convenience store at 11 p.m. when Jackie was there, when allegedly he was at home? Police asked this of Gerald's stepdaughter. She told authorities that he must have been home because she was confident that she would have heard Gerald if he left the house. But detectives, they were still suspicious of Gerald because at his interview, he had abrasions all over his hands. They decided to reach out to Jackie's friends again, and they told police that Gerald would blatantly hit on Jackie when she started to work at his parents' business. This made her feel very uncomfortable, and that's why she quit and got a job at the cafe. Gerald would consistently go to the cafe and still try to get Jackie to go out on a date with him. Even though she shut him down each time, Gerald persisted. And then came the next red flag. Gerald's own brother reached out to the police to say that he saw Gerald's car parked next to the road that you would use to go to Jackie's house at about 11 p.m. on the night of Jackie's murder. Now, my dear listeners, it's starting to sound like this could be an open and shut case, but it isn't. There was still no physical evidence tying Gerald to Jackie's murder. But what the police could do was charge him with evidence tampering since they could prove that he lied about his relationship with Jackie. As police went to arrest him, they found out that Gerald was no longer in town. At that time, he was on a plane that was going towards Los Angeles, California, and then transferring to go to Thailand. Apparently, Gerald's father had recently purchased a foundry in Thailand, and Gerald was going to work there. Police were able to arrest Gerald at the Los Angeles airport, but they couldn't get their charges to stick. Gerald was then released. But that is not the last that police would hear of Gerald. In 1993, he tried to kidnap a woman off a busy road. He was sentenced with attempted kidnapping, and he got only two years in prison. But all of Gerald's lawyers could not protect him forever. In 2007, investigators started to relook at this case and realized that police actually did have biological evidence from Jackie's killer due to her being sexually assaulted. With DNA testing now being available, police obtained a search warrant for Gerald's DNA, and it was a match. Gerald was charged with Jackie's murder, and this is when his house of cards came tumbling down. At his trial in 2010, witnesses testified that Gerald was at the convenience store where Jackie was seen near her house at the night of her murder. After the DNA evidence was presented, Gerald's stepdaughter testified she was wrong. Gerald absolutely could have snuck out of the house and returned without her seeing him. Gerald was found guilty of first-degree murder and sexual assault. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole for the murder of the young girl that was a bright light to her community and who was the target of his obsession. Thank you all for joining me for our latest episode of Horrifying History. Join us on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram at Horrifying underscore History, on Twitter at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1, or reach out to us by email at HorrifyingHistory at Outlook.com and tell us your thoughts on the cases that we spoke about today. Now, if you haven't done it yet, please remember to hit the subscribe button for our podcast, For when you do, not only do you let other people know about our show, but you download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our next episode, The Isdal Woman. If you would love to take home a piece of horrifying history, you need to check out our store. You guys will find some great items by going to redbubble.com and by searching for horrifying history in their search box. And if you want to get a bunch of amazing perks like ad-free episodes, free merch, additional content, and much, much more, we are now on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash horrifyinghistory to sign up today. Thank you all for listening. And until next time...